very special guest, very talented person, and uh, on top of that, he is a heart of gold. Um, he's a dear friend of mine, someone that I have a lot of respect for, and I'm grateful that I could have him in our show, Gravesend. But not only a, a, as an actor, um, when I had seen him in a movie called The Nail, I really seen the talent that um, that he had. Um, as an actor, I thought he did an amazing job in that. And then uh, I started to listening to some music that I didn't really, I wasn't really familiar knowing that he was so musically talented. And I started listening to some of his music and uh, some stuff that he's written. And uh, he wrote a song for us uh, in that we play in Gravesend. Uh, and it, it, it's really heartfelt and we're able to have a few songs from, from Tony. Um, that's when Tony Luke is here today. And I just don't know if people realize how talented he is as a musician and um, writer and also as a singer. Uh, our subject today that we were going to discuss was about bullying, about people that are, you know, haters. And um, I know to I know Tony's and in heavily involved in that, and he has he just wrote a song about that. And um, it's a pleasure to have Tony Luke with us now. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. You're too kind, but thank you. Um, it, first of all, it, w it was an honor to, to work with you and an honor to be a part of Gravesend. And the, the music for me is, is so important. I mean, it's why I love film so much. Film is a medium like music that tells a story and it affects people greatly. So to be able to be in, in a series of the caliber as your series, just as an actor alone, it's, I'm unbelievably honored, but then to have some of my music to be a part of that series, I can't explain to you what, what that feels like. I am so, so grateful. Your songs are absolutely genius, but one thing about you, Tony, is you wear your heart on your sleeve. So these songs are just not words put down on paper. They're heartfelt songs with words that are trials and tribulations that you've had in your lifetime that you put down in words that now that you're singing. So now when you have different depictions in the movie of, of different scenes, some of your songs just fit so perfectly in with what's going on. And I think that it was just a great match. And, you know, a lot of people know you for other things other than music. And you are literally a genius when it comes to writing words down on paper and putting it to, to music. Well, so I, hats off to you on that. Thank you very much. I, uh, I know this kind of sounds corny, uh, I, but I don't care. When people ask me, how did you write that? I, I don't, I don't. I, I just, I, I'm a vessel and it just, it comes to me from somewhere else. All things originate from, from, from a different place. And I just feel blessed that I can be a vessel or open to hearing the music. Because when I write, that's what it, like if you said to me, come sit in a room, write a song for me. I can't, I, I can't do it. I, right, because that's just music. But you sit, you write stuff about stuff that you've been through, that you're going through, and you put it into words. And I, I hear it now. I've been, I've been lucky, and I say lucky because I have had the highest highs I never thought even possible for someone from where I came from. You know, I came from Ethan McClellan, born and raised in South Philly, um, in my neighborhood. Not very different from New York. I remember the first time I took, uh, I drove into New York City, and I I, th I thought, wow, this is going to be different. I'm like, nah, it's just a big South Philly. Like, 
there's so many similarities to growing up in South Philly and growing up in Brooklyn, you know? And I wouldn't trade it, if that makes any sense. Like, there were so many horrible things that happened to me as a kid that it made me who I am. I always tell people, don't ever look at regret. Don't, don't entertain regret. And if you had a chance to go back and change something, don't. Because anything that you've done or anything that you've been through has brought you to where you are Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. So I don't ever, I, I don't look at regret. I don't look at the past. When I do look at the past, I look at it for the lessons. And then I, I look at it to appreciate the things I have now because if the past taught me anything, nothing is forever. And all we really ever, ever have is the moment right now. We have no idea what tomorrow is going to be, and we can't do anything about the past. So we have to make the most of now. And we, we, we tend to live our lives through social media anymore, and we, we compare ourselves to everyone. And I think getting on the, the, the point of bullying, when I was a kid, if you were bullied... I'm not advocating this at all, but I'm just showing the difference in from yesterday to today. When I was a kid, if you had a problem with a kid in school, you know, it was like, you know what? You two have a problem. Go take it outside and finish it, straighten it out. And when I was a kid, there wasn't, nobody was shooting you or stabbing you. You let it out. You respected each other when you were done and it was over. And most of the time, as corny as it sounds, you, end up you had a friend. Friends. You end up being friends. Today, it's very, very different. And I understand why, because today, when someone's bullying you, they're not bullying you in front of 20 people in a the classroom, they're bullying you on social media. And now there's a thousand people that are watching it, a thousand people that are sharing what's going on, and your whole life revolves around an image now. It's an image. Not real, but it's an image. And these kids are destroyed by that image to, to live up to a standard that is impossible for anyone who, anyone average, any, and I don't even mean average by average, I just mean the normal person cannot live up to the image that is portrayed in social media. And they look at that and they go, well, that's how I want my life to be. I want this, I want that. And most of the times, none of that is real. So we, 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 kids build themselves up to this expectation of, of, of these role models that is unattainable. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's unattainable. And if you don't, and if you don't fall into that click and you're not part of that, we dealt with physical bullying that still goes on. But the damage of emotional and mental bullying has far greater reach than physical. I can get up and I could punch you and I can hurt you. But, you know, a week from now, you're, you're, it'll heal. There'll be a bruise and it'll go away. So true. But if I say something to you that I really know gets to you, you'll carry that your entire life until you learn how to deal with it and put it away. But a lot of kids can't do that. Just the fact that we are living in a time where suicide rates are higher than they've ever been in history. And young kids are killing themselves over things that we would look at and go, why, why would you take your life over that? Like, why? Because 60 people said that you look terrible in that outfit on social media. You think it, like it's the, because they're, they're not, there's no, there's no interconnections. There's no... When we were kids, what did you do? I'm, the one thing I'll never forget, I'll remember as long as I live, is what time do you have to be home? It was always the same thing. As soon as the street lights come on, come home. Yeah. That was the time. And you woke up in the morning and you went out and you played and you met people and you interacted with people. Well, you know, we don't do that anymore. So all the interaction comes from social media so your whole life is wrapped up in what other people think about you. And then you start judging yourself on someone else's opinion. And they're not, no one's ever taught that someone's opinion of you is just that. It's their opinion of you. 
And and every time I speak or anywhere I go and and I speak, I always I always say the same thing to people. You know your worth. You know you. And you're perfect the way you are. And I never never allow anyone's opinion to have power over me because that I don't even respond when someone said something nasty about me on social media because I won't give them the power to know that oh I read that and you upset me so now I'm going to respond to you that's what they want that's what they want they want to push it to do that that's exactly what they want to do and and I won't give them the time I won't will not give them the power over me to do that you know what it is it's that I always say this and what happens today is when you put your feet forward and you do something and you try to achieve whatever it may be and you set yourself up there and you're going to try to, to, to do something very big and be there, you're, you're putting yourself in a place where people are going to criticize you. And if you're not being criticized, that means you're not doing a good job. If you're being criticized by people and people are saying stuff about your appearance, about the way you look, about your religion, about anything about you, which I think that people that could even do stuff like that, I don't even understand the mental issues that they have to even do that. Well, they're haters. It, it, and then I it, believe deep-heartedly that they don't like themselves. That's exactly right. Exactly. They don't like exactly. themselves. Exactly right. So what they try to do is they try to push it off to somebody else to make themselves feel better about exactly. themselves. Because, 100%. Because if you take your, if you, whatever it may be, playing baseball, acting, music, and you set something up and you get something and people get to see it, you're going to get people that will hate on it. Absolutely. Just to hate on it. They will just hate on it just because they don't like you for some ungodly reason. And because that's you're means. successful and they're not. And the sad thing is that people, young people that don't have thick skin and aren't tough enough to deal with this, they retreat and they won't do something. When I make a movie or I do something, or I, I, my series as it is, and it's getting so much attention. When this show came out, and all the attention that we got, some of the negativity has was so, and I knew that it was making an impact just by that. Right. And it, it's, for instance, like when I first started acting, I had a little part in the Bronx Tale, I only had a couple of lines. That, I, which is your first movie that you were in. And there's two type of people. There were people that would say to me, well, well, I got up to go to the bathroom and you were gone. I already missed you. And and I, and I, then there's the other people that were like, that's a great start. Let's see what's going to happen. Hope this goes somewhere. It's like anything else. Even like, for instance, we did a video in front of l and I'm in front of Lenny's the last day. I put two slices on top of each other and oh my, did, did, I mimicked the whole John Travolta thing. I can't tell you how many people commented. People don't eat pizza like that. The pizza. I don't even understand. This yeah. is the one thing that They're makes morons. me crazy. Is I just don't know how someone could write something negative and press that button to do it. They take the don't time even, to do it. Everyone's entitled to an opinion. Enough, guys. Everyone is entitled to an opinion, but they have to get their point across, and they have to give it to... It, it's just... I don't understand it. I don't... This is all... I, I say one thing to younger actors and people that are trying to get out there. Surround yourself with positivity and positive people because that's what you need in yes. your life. You can't even... And like you said, Tony, you can't even... You can't even answer these people because that's what they want. What they want to do is take you off your game. They know that that gets to you and that it bothers you. It, it, you took it, it took you off your game, and listen, we're all we all have hearts, and no matter how thick your skin is, no matter what it is, when people are saying bad things about you, it can hurt you. It's just it's it, 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 it's it could, a, and some people are more weak minded than other people, where other people can push it off, but some people can affect of people's course. lives. But the sad thing is, is that the younger people who are now when we were younger, like Tony said, we didn't have to deal with that. Well, that was we the difference of being... Course, we, we, we were street people. We would go at 3 o'clock after school and knuckle it out in the schoolyard. Today, kids do not... Their way of socializing isn't on the streets, isn't hanging out after school. Their way of socializing is on social media. 
So these people could be whoever they want to be. If you are not the tallest guy, you could be a giant on social media. If you're not the prettiest girl, you could be beautiful on social media. So these people hide behind social media. Okay. And a lot of these guys that write bad things about the pizza or write things to me, I say to myself, this person really hates themselves. So sometimes I get myself caught up with writing back, but you know what I do? To stick it in their ass? I'll write back to them. I see that you really are not having a good time in life. You really must hate yourself to write about somebody that you don't like. But you are on my page in writing, and now this is the second or third time. You are my biggest fan. Exactly. So thank yeah. you. They are your And friends. have a great day. Yeah. And then sometimes you'll have people that just don't write back at all and delete their shit, or some people that all of a sudden write back and write, wow, that was cool, and you have a great day too. So sometimes you could almost mind fuck a bully to realize, you know what? This guy's all right. Here I am making fun of him. And haters, at the end of the day, are our motivators. And they and the best thing is they hide behind fake pages more than anything. Yes. That's the whole thing. It's a like, thousand what do you have a fake page for? Well, if you have a fake page, you're obviously up to no good. <laughs> well, why, why do you have it? What, what, what's, what's the point in that? Plus 99% of everyone that comments like that would never say that to your face. True. Ever. They feel empowered by the internet. Yeah, That's because they know is. they're protected by that. Yeah. And, and 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 I gotta be honest, I, I agree with you. I there's a part of me when I read stuff like I like I I always put something up. I try to keep my personal business off of social media. I have a fight with my girl, I don't put it on social yeah. media. There's a pro I don't put it on social media. If I try to put anything on social media, it is to support people that I care about or put something positive up. I don't air my dirty laundry on social media. Awesome. Never do it. But I do on my son's birthday and on the day he died, I'll always post something that doesn't say, oh, feel sorry for me, but it just says, if you've lost someone keep keep be strong it's always something that will be positive about it uplifting and i can't tell you how many people will say incredibly derogatory things about my son in the post now i don't delete them and i don't block them i hide the comment and i'm i'm being serious i hide that comment because what i don't want is people that are on that website or on my social media to get hurt by the comments that he's saying about me with their children. So I hide it. I don't delete it because I want them to think, yeah, I left it up there. Because when they look at it, they think it's still up there. They don't know it. it's, it's hidden because I won't even give them the satisfaction of blocking them. And then I sit there and I say, how bad... Have you been hurt? How bad is your life that you would say something like that to a grieving father just to get my attention for me to come back at you with something? And I won't, you know, I, I won't do that. And there's an old saying before, some, growing up, I, I always said, if everyone, if everyone loves you and no one has ever been an enemy of yours of any kind, then you've never done or stood for anything your entire life. Because I don't care who you are. No one who stands for anything, no matter what it is, will be loved by everyone. If you're looking to be loved by everyone, then the earth is not the place for you to be. Exactly. Right? You know what I mean? You just have to know that if you, you do things without an agenda, and, and I try to live my life with that, with no agenda... If you do that and, and you try to make a difference every day, I don't care what anybody says about me. It's never going to turn me around from doing what I believe is the right thing. You could say, you can call me anything you want to call me. That's fine. If anything, and when people go, because I hear people say this all the time, well, I'll pray for them. Here's my, my answer to that. Praying for someone to be a better person is really egotistical. 
and, and, and self-centered. Because the minute I say I want to pray for you, that then I'm basically saying I'm so much of a better person than you are. Let me pray for you. I always thought that that was kind of a backhanded kind of thing. So I always thought if you're going to pray for someone, then just pray that they find peace in their own life. Don't ever say, I pray that they become a better human being. Because the minute you say that, then you feel that you're above every, anyone that you're speaking that about. So I always say, you know what? I'm going to just pray that they find peace in their life. Because I'm not going to pray for them to be better because I'm judging them. I don't want to be judged. And I don't think I'm better than anyone. And who gives that person the power? Right, to, to say, to you know, yeah, to that. be able to say that. So my tolerance for when you lose a child the first thing I tell people is let me give you one bit of advice that I can give you if you ever run across someone who buried a child you can say that you're sorry for their loss if there's anything I can ever do I'm here and then shut the fuck up and walk away because there is nothing that you are going to say that will make them feel any better. Now, I believe, I, I believe my son is in a better place. I believe it. But I don't want you to tell me that he is. I don't want you to say God has a reason for everything. I believe that he does, but I don't want to hear it from you. I would rather I tell people, just say, I'm sorry for your loss and walk away. Because people get hurt more when you tell them God has a reason, time will heal all things. Time doesn't heal all things, okay? You can learn to manage things better, but there is the, 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 the most ignorant thing I have ever heard in my entire life, and it wasn't said to me, it was said to my girl, who isn't violent, who at a party lost her shit, and I don't know why she lost. Like, I'm, I'm like, this is so not her. And when I questioned her what happened, she said, why don't you ask that woman what she just said to me? And she's like, why did I? I'm like, ask her. I said, babe, just let it go. Would it, and now I would have not have lost my shit because I'm used to it. But the woman literally said to him, I heard Tony lost his son. And she said he did. Now, at the time, it was 18 months he had been gone. And she said, when, when did he die? And she said, 18 months ago. He says, well, he's not over it yet? Like, it's 18 months. Wow. And she just completely... Now, to be honest, if she would have said it to me, I would not have lost my shit. I would have looked at her and said, you don't understand. And I would have walked away. But she was so angry at that remark that... She lost it. But you learn how to be more tolerant because sometimes even when people mean well, they may say things that hurt and they don't, they don't, they don't realize it. So for me, I've, I've learned to be much more tolerant to, to people that are ignorant to, well, to certain things. The thing is, is that today, it's like, if you think about years ago, when people said stuff and did stuff, you know, and I'm not condoning it either, but you, you, you know, you stepped up and you handled certain things that you, you wanted to do today. When you have some sort of success and you're known and you're out there and people know who you are and you can't even react in it. They, they want people press you and press you and press you because they want you to react. They want to sue you. They want to see you go down, and that's what they want. Mm -hmm. They We're want to knock you down. Today where that's some, just to even think about them, I just don't even understand people like to even say something like that to, 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 to your girl. It's just people want reactions too, and it, 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 and they'll, they'll poke you and poke you and poke you, especially if they know you have something to lose. Because what, are you going to step down and deal with this? You can't. In society today. And that's what I miss about the old days more than anything. Because there was none of this social media and stuff like that. And men were men. And things were different. People well, you were held accountable. Yeah. People, mm -hmm. you know, they push gangsters. There's this wise guy site. People tips talking about gangsters and this and that. And this. They would never say this to people's faces. Imagine what, like, years ago, how things were and, and what it is today with this. Everybody got held accountable. 
what came out of their mouth or an action that they did. Yeah, no one's held accountable doubt. today. Today? For it's anything. Like, yeah. but, but Tony, the, the thing is, is that what I notice about you too is, is that the grief and, and, and the hurt that you went through, one thing I notice about you more than anyone is that I see that you put this stuff out there to help others. The song you came up with, One More Nighty, that song is is like, I lost my dog, who was the close, very close to me, and, and I had to listen to that. Like, I mean, you're you're helping other people. And even when, and I see how you're, you're, you have the hand out there and you're not hiding it. You're not hiding it and you're, you're trying to let people be aware of how serious that this is and, and the epidemic that we're up against too. But what happened to your son even? It's just, it's just and you're, you're, you're reaching so many people and, and to get any negativity from that is just even, it, it, I don't even understand it. I mean, I know that it's probably, you know, you're so loved by so many people. So I'm sure you get an overwhelming amount of people that are there for you as well, like we said. But you're trying to make a difference. I mean, like you said, what you and, and our other good friend, Steve Matarano, and I see you guys, you know, I know you guys are close, but I also think that there's a bond that you two share that only you two even know about. Like you said, I mean, I don't think there could be anything worse than losing a child in the world. I mean, what, what could even be worse than that? And to go through that, but you're trying to make a difference so other people, you have a, you're trying to give a voice to people to, to reach out and to not overlook certain things. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I told Stevie, you know, it's a club that nobody wants to be in. And um, there's always that, that bond, that connection of, of, of loss. I, I, I was asked once, why, why is it so different losing a child? And I gave it a lot of thought, like a lot of thought. Because loss is loss. And, you know, you, no one wants to compare loss. No one says, oh, well, I lost a brother. Oh, well, I lost an uncle. Well, I lost a mother. It's not a competition on, on loss. And, but I figured, why, why is it? Why is the loss of a child so, so different than another loss? And then it hit me. There's no place to put it. See, you know you're going to lose your mother and father. You know you're going to probably bury a sibling. You know you're going to you're going to bury a spouse. You know cousins, aunts, and uncles. You know that those things are the natural order. So you lose them, and then you think of them, and you they're here. There's no place to put losing a child because it's not. It, I mean, it is natural. Death is death, but it's not supposed to be. So. Your mind has nowhere to put it. And then after years of trying to figure out, like the song in One More Night, in the last verse of that song, where I struggle with the fact that he died and I never got to say goodbye. And I kept thinking, why was I denied that? Like, why couldn't I say goodbye? And then it hit me. As long as the person you love is in here, as long as their light is in you, you don't ever have to say goodbye. Or you could say goodbye whenever you want to say goodbye. Because it's they're here. They're not in the ground. That's not where they are. They're here. And they'll always be here. No matter what, they will always be here. So if you remember that and you hold that memory, then you never have to say goodbye. You know what I mean? They're always part and will always be part of you until, until it's time for again. you to go home. Until we meet again. Until you meet again. And that's, you know, that's the way I look at it, you know, and, and the music that I try to write and things that I try to do are based on letting people know that this is just... It, it, it's just a vehicle that we're in, like a car that you drive. 
You know, the car gets old and, and the car doesn't run anymore. But it's not your soul. It's not who you are. You're inside of this. Everyone was given a vehicle to use. So this is the vehicle that he's got, you got, you got, and I've got. Okay, once the vehicle dies and the vehicle breaks down and it's over, you don't stop. You know, you live on. I'm, and again, these are my beliefs. Okay, so you're not, I heard someone say something that was really amazing to me and, and it was, was just so brilliant. And it talked about, he talked about color. And about race is what he talked about. And he said, the sad thing about race is that all we see is the color of someone's skin or how tall they are or, or what they look like. We see that. And we think that that is them, that you're Italian or you're white or you're black or you're Asian and, or, or whatever your nationality is. But you're really not. It's just the color of the car that you're driving. It's not who you are. Right. Your soul is not your color. Your soul is not your race. It is not where you come from. Your soul is from another place. It's just the car that you're driving is from a certain place or it's a certain color. But it's not you. And until we as a society understand that everyone, soul, is their soul. And let me tell you something, make no mistake, every soul that walks the face of this earth is connected to every other soul. So when I go and I speak and people say, why do you care so much about my son? Why do you care? And I go, you don't get it. Because when your son dies, a part of me dies too. When you grieve, a part of me grieves too. Because we are all connected. We're all the same. We just get so caught up in our own ego and our own self-worth that we forget that every single life touches every other life. And that's what I hope when I write and the music that I put out, that it makes people understand it more, that we are all connected and every one loss is everyone's loss. Wow. I'm sorry, I've ran. No, no, that, 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 that was It's heavy, really, but it's true. brilliantly said. <clears throat> that really, really it makes well. it should make people think. It's not just what we and see on the your, outside. Your, your music is so inside. touching and so great, and and we love having it in our show, and and uh, other stuff about you. Like I said, your your movie, the nail that you did, you did such a great job with that. Oh, you thank know? you. I was very scared. I I I, I was pulling a, pulling a William DeMayo, which is. That was the first time, you know, I wrote the story, I played the lead, I sang the, the title track of the song, and we shot that movie in, in uh, 19 days, I think 18 or 19 days, with not much of a budget. And anyone who's watching, if you don't do film, if you're not a filmmaker, you realize that a normal movie maybe does two pages, three pages a day. So, you know, we were doing like 12, 13 pages a day, because wow. there was no money. But even that movie was based upon what it's like growing up in an abusive family, you know, having a father who, who, you know, abuses the mother and, and the child and overcoming that, that abuse. And that was another story on how we're all connected. Here's this ex-convict who really doesn't know this family but are connected in the circumstances that life ties us all together with. And I have to tell you, I, I told you before and I'll say it again, you have no idea how much respect that I have for, for you as a human being and your talent. And uh, you, you will never know when you came up to me and you said to me, hey man, I watched The Nail and I love that movie. You have no idea what that meant to me. Well, well, it wasn't just me, I, I think you, and thank you, but I heard Will Smith called you or something. Didn't Will Smith reach out to you about Yeah, he that? did, he had watched the film and um, he had said to me, so I came home, I, I think he was, promoting seven pounds at the time. He said, I came home and there was a DVD here because his dad was, I was very good friends with his father. And he said, this is something you, you, know, you need to see because it was all over cable. At that point, it was literally the number six most watched movie on cable. Oh, wow. For, I mean, one of the six on Cinemax and Showtime, it was, you couldn't turn cable on and not see the film. What year was this? 
2009. Okay. And and he calls me up, and first a woman calls, goes, I'm looking for Tony Luke Jr., and I'm like, it's me. She's like, hold for Will Smith, please. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so they get on the phone, and it's Will, and he says, Tony, I'm not going to mean to bother you. I'm like, I got your number from my dad. I'm like, no, what's up? He said, I just want you to know I came back from uh, promoting uh, Seven Pounds. He said, and I come home, and uh, Jade is not here, kids aren't here, and I have this kind of theater in my house. And there's this... DVD there that says you really need to watch this. So out of respect for my dad, I throw it on, wow. and then I see Philly, and I figured I'm going to watch five minutes of this. Tell my father, yeah, you know, like I watch. He said I'm watching it, and I can't stop watching it. And then all of a sudden, I start my eyes start to water. He said, and now I'm bawling, watching this film and I was so moved by this movie that I wanted to call you and tell you what can I do like how do I help people see this and I said Will I appreciate it but 20th Century Fox picked it up it's in every language in every country wow. it's it's on TV congratulations thank you it's constantly Amazing. thank you and, and good friend Leo Rossi in there Leah and and, and my dearest friend like my brother like literally I can say this and if you listen, you know how much I love you. William Forsyth is literally my brother. Like, our relationship is like a brother relationship. And, and talk about a pro, I was, he was the only person when we were doing the film I was intimidated by. And I had never met him. And he walked on, on set and we started to talk. And, I, and he said to me, let's take a walk. Let's go get something to eat. We stopped and we sat down. Here's what he said to me. William, like this is William Forsythe. And he said, Tony, what are you nervous about? I'm like, William, I've watched everything you've done. He said, listen to me. I'm a supporting character in this film. My job is to make sure that you give the best performance that you could possibly give, ever. He said, don't look at me that way. I'm an actor. You're an actor. He said... You're going to bring it, Tony. And if you don't bring it, then I failed. Then I failed in that scene with you if you don't bring it. Because I need to give you what you need to make that work. And there's one scene in particular in the movie in the locker room. And it was one of the most touching scenes. And it was one of the greatest acting lessons I've, I've ever done. And I remember when the director said, cut. William said, did you get that? Tell me you got that. Did you get that? We good? Are we good? Play it back. Did you get that? And he hugged me, and we started talking, and we just became unbelievably close. And I consider him family like I consider uh, Leo family. And when we premiered that show, we premiered it in L.A., and I couldn't, I wasn't in the theater. I can't watch myself. I have a problem looking at myself on camera. You don't watch your films at all? I try not to. Like Even though you were involved in behind the scenes of it since you No, yeah, I mean I I see it, but then yeah. when a crowd is watching, I like Invincible I can't get away from. The character in Invincible is iconic and no matter where I go, everyone screams out, you know, so I, I can't get away from Invincible, but the nail, I thought, oh, you know, cuz that was Disney, this was the nail. And um I couldn't I, I, I had to leave the room, so I kind of was look, peering in uh, because Bobby Mar Maresco was watching it and there were a few other people, and I was really worried. And I remember when the, when it was over, one of the greatest moments was William Forsythe you know, had come up to me and he hugged me and he said to me, I will work with you in any film anywhere in the world. That's Just great. pick up a phone. He said, because I am so proud of this film and I've always been proud of it. He said, and you really... And it was, it was a very emotional time for me telling, telling that story. And, and I was heavy, you know, and it, it was, was a about, huge compliment. you know, and, and he, he was just amazing. And it is one of those films where I've, I'm very proud of the film. I will always be proud of the film. And it doesn't, it's not going anywhere. Like it's, it's still out there. And the music again is the same thing. The music is harder because 
they're, you're dealing with algorithms and there's a, you know, they don't want to push that kind of algorithm. So I'm always kind of pulling, you know, fighting the stream, but you know, that started the sound mind network foundation, which deals with bullying and trauma and, 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 and mental health and addiction and all of those things. And, and that has been a focus with me from, from day one, which is why, again, I can't thank you enough for having me here today to give me some kind of a platform to talk about that. And we were talking earlier about Ryan Brown. Ryan oh, Brown is, is, was 15 when we first spoke. She had just turned 16. And she is very open that she had dealt with some depression issues. And I had written a song called After Midnight. And the song is about, basically, if you could make it to one minute after midnight, you have survived another day, and there is always hope that tomorrow will be better, tomorrow that things can change. You can always wow. make things change. And the, mo the song talks about social media, school shootings, locking people away with mental health issues, addiction, forcing you to self-medicate those issues but i promise you if you can get to 1201 there is always hope and and in my music i i try very much to always set the message that whatever you're going through there is always hope you just cannot give up please don't give up that is my the biggest message i, I try to give it's wonderful and just think about this if that song could be listened by someone and it could save even just one life. It's worth. Absolutely. It's, of course it's worth it just for, and, and getting back to William Forsythe, he was, a, he was a gem to work with in Gravesend, plays the boss of the Florida crew, uh, Santini Trofado, and William is, is such a pro. He is oh, such God. a pro. He is, his, he, he comes so prepared He'll never phone it in. This is mm -hmm. one. This guy takes his work so seriously. He's had a tremendous career. I mean, look at how many. He's movies. a man of many faces. Yeah. Yes. If mean, you look at his whole history of movies and the different characters that he's played, I mean, he can go from a mob boss to a deranged lunatic to exactly. it's just unbelievable. And for William, it's not any. The one thing about William, it's not about the spotlight for William at all. William just comes to act, to just do his job, and he just, he's always on point. It was, I'm honored to have William in, in, in Gravesend. And, uh, you know, like you were talking about with this bullying and haters, it's like if you watch my movie back in the, back in the day, the first scene that Anthony Rodriguez is talking about, he's talking about the people that don't have the balls to go for it. And th those are the people that you just put behind you and you just focus. And that's what the, the message for these young kids and young actors and young musicians and young people that are coming up and you gotta stay with it. And don't, just stay like this. Don't let the noise. Don't lose sight of your vision. You can't lose sight of your vision. You can't let, let the noise. people knock you down. Because the noise is what people, they want to deter you. So if you are going for something and people are saying it's not good or doing things or saying you can't do it, that just makes, that will give you more of a reason to make it happen. I agree with that. It's true. Christian, you have any questions for Tony? No, um, I'll just say, like, kind of piggybacking off what we were talking about before, it's like being a young person, you know, in this day and age, like, with all these avenues out there and just seeing how people lower themselves and um, see it fit to attack people and put a lot of pressure uh, on someone to try and be perfected, I feel like you just have to, you know, encourage yourself sometimes because there's always going to be, it's always going to be a fight. Every day is a fight. Um, and I'll just say, like, sometimes there's, there's not always going to be people in your life that understand what you're going through. So you have to sometimes encourage yourself and tell yourself that everything's going to be all right. Because your family, you know, while they always, you know, you would think that they want to be there for you, and you know, give you the right advice. Um, 
they don't always understand what's going on in your mind. They don't understand everything that's going on in your life. And um, we all have to take a moment and encourage ourselves once in a while, you know, and tell ourselves everything's going to be all right and not listen to that negativity because it's so sticky. Well, you, you hit on something that was really important. The one thing I learned is you will never, ever be perfect, and you're not supposed to. See, because when someone believes that they are perfect, they become complacent, and complicity is the worst possible place in the world you ever want to be. The greatest artist I've ever known, people that I've worked with that I've respected, that are most brilliant piano players I've ever heard play, or brilliant writers ever, and I would say to them, you're the greatest writer. They go, no, 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 I'm not because I'm always trying to be better. I will never say that I'm great. I will never say that this is the best performance I have ever had because I don't believe that it's so. And even on the day that you get called home, you'll never reach perfection, but that's what life is. Life is pursuing the dream. Life is always trying, Always try to be a better version of who you are every Absolutely. single day moving Absolutely. forward. And you'll never fail. You can't fail. See, because no one can judge you. Only you can judge you. And if, if you're always trying to be a better version, notice I didn't say be a better person. Not a better person, a better version. Because who am I to tell you what is a good person and what is not a good person? So if you're always trying to be a better version of you, if you're always trying to be better at your craft, it is a lifelong journey. Okay, and and is not a prize to win at the end. You know what I said? If there was something to strive for, if I could tell someone, if there's anything you want to strive for, this is what it should be. It doesn't matter whether you live to be 20, 60, 90, or 100. To me, the greatest affirmation of a life well lived is that when your day comes, and someone comes to visit you at the wake, if that person kneels next to you and says, my life was better because you were in it, then you've achieved all that you ever need to achieve. Period. Well, I could tell you, my life is better because you're in it. Oh, right back at you, my brother. Thank you. Wow, that was deep, guys. <laughs> a lot of love in this room. That a lot was of positivity. Deep. Yeah, I don't think I can't know. stop noticing this jacket. Yeah. It, <laughs> it I love me, it. It brings yeah. me back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the, the Wanderers. The Wanderers. Where did you even find that jacket? Online. I said, I, I, once I seen this jacket, I said, I got to get this jacket. I'm such a And your size, this. too. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> wow. Yeah, Do you remember that movie? Oh, I love that movie. Who Incredible. Like the Wanderers? Love it. Love it. You know, we need... The Ducky know, Boys. Yeah. We the Fordham Baldies. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days when, when the movies, the Warriors, the Wanderers, the Outsiders, you know, hopefully we get movies like that again. Because yes. It's been a long time to even see movies like that. That was Ken Wall, right? Yeah, Ken yeah. Wall. Well, you ain't done. You're just starting, my brother. Yeah, that's it. You got many series, many so, movies ahead of you, my friend. Absolutely. Yeah, anything right. that you miss, all you got to do is just make. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> that's right. That's it. So, uh, I think you had asked me this question once. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question now. The Wanderers or The Warriors? That's a tough one. Both yeah. iconic movies. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's almost like the Bronx versus Brooklyn, but there, of course, you got the, 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 the Warriors was, a, was the Bronx, and the, um, the Wanderers was the Bronx, and the Warriors is Brooklyn. So, they're... It's such a oh, yeah. Hard, they were trying to get back to Coney Island. Hard, even though hardly not that much of it shot in Brooklyn, but it's just such that there's, that's such a hard question. If I had to, I might give the Warriors a hair, just a hair, like you know the Warriors, just everything about just something that. about cinematically. That um, it's gritty. Oh, yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. You know the you train know, scene cinematically, with Cyrus. They, they both have and to, and they you know the Wanderers soundtrack. Oh, yeah. Is, yes. 
and Frankie Valli sings some of the songs, Walk Like a Man. We have some of Frankie Valli's music in, in Gravesend, which I, you know, that's a whole Frankie Valli's just iconic. To meet Frankie Valli and to have Frankie Valli being part of, of Gravesend. But um, The Wanderers was, well, that, that movie, you know, it's just unbelievable. Great movie. stuff. Great cars. Too. Great, great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love those classic cars. Yeah. You know, sometimes I watch movies, you know, maybe stuff that I wasn't even interested in just to see the clothing that they're wearing, the cars that they're driving. And then before you know it, you get entangled in the actual show that you're watching. Yeah. And t Tony, where could we, um, if we want to, you know, could you tell us where we could, like, tell tell your fans and the audience where they could see, like, you know... Support your music. your music and, and um... Like Especially the movie, The Nail. Yeah. Where can they get the that? The Nail is on Tubi. You can see it on Tubi. You have to pay for it on Amazon and iTunes, but it is free on Tubi. Um, my music, my social media is Tony Luke Jr., Jr. Uh, Ryan Brown just released After Midnight. Uh, give it a check it out one more night uh, on all streaming platforms but the video kind of hits hard my one wanted to do a video which is me on the piano doing the song so people can I wanted it like a one-on-one -on -one. I had an album out called strong and broken places but we pulled it because with the new label now they want to release they want to re-release the album so it's really oh. good I just did a compilation album with uh, Taj Mahal, Cindy Lauper, Joan Osborne. Oh wow! So all of that that comes out. Where I, I think I'm going to get in trouble because the big press release for that is okay. like April 20th. Okay. But we just did a giant compilation album. It's really Bacon Brothers are on it. We worked with them, and it's the foundation is SoundMindNetwork.org. There is a GoFundMe on there, and. Any, I appreciate anything that anyone can do. I don't ever see a penny of that money. And what we do is we give money to any kind of organization that uses music and art as therapy for people that struggle with trauma and mental health and oh, addiction. That's great. Wow, that's great. That yeah, is we, really I, good. I know that once um, Gravesend comes out and they hear your music also in the in the show and and you know you're part of our soundtrack i know those songs are going to and we're going to support that completely um because it's they're, they're, they they need to be heard they really need to be heard and uh, i want to also touch on there was a kid um trevor he was on america's got talent 2019. and he had cancer this was 2019 he had cancer and he was being bullied by kids they called him the cancer kid, young kid. My God. And he started playing the violin. He didn't want to be known as the kid with cancer. He wanted to be known as the kid with the violin. And he played that violin on America's Got Talent. And he was so amazing. And Simon pressed the buzzer. Oh, golden oh, buzzer. Golden ticket. Simon pressed the buzzer and said, there's to your haters. <laughs> So to all you people out there that are trying to get stuff done and going there and starting, just remember that. Keep going. And the people, the haters, are your biggest fans. Absolutely. And take it as motivation and don't ever stop. The door closes, go to the next door and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't stop. Rise above. There you go. And the only time you should ever stand over somebody else is when you're lifting them up. We come from Brooklyn.